From UBN Studios, you're listening to Unsugarcoated with Alia, bringing you interviews with public figures and inspirational people, speaking on self-improvement with empowering themes. And I'm your host, Alia Lanius. Hello, everybody, and oh my goodness, I cannot believe it. We have actually made it through another amazing season of your favorite social good podcast, Unsugarcoated with Alia. I have had such a good time and I'm actually, this is perfect because at the time of this taping, uh, next week I'll be headed to Cannes Film Festival. I am very, very excited about that. It'll be the first time in two years since the pandemic occurred and I just can't wait to be on the Riviera having a glass of champagne. I'm sorry, don't hate me. But you know, it's, it's more of being there to appreciate what we do and how much effort, you know, when we are talking about the season theme of trusting the process, don't forget, I do that in my life. And when people look at our lives and they see my husband and I traveling all over the world and on these red carpets, there's work that goes into that. Nobody is sitting on the couch just hoping things align and just hoping money falls from the ceilings, right? Because like I've said, even if you want to win the lotto, you still got to get up off the couch, go out there and buy a ticket. Nothing is coming for free. So everything that we do, we curate that. We work hard to make these things happen. Um, For my husband, like I've shared before, in the last three years, he's produced 13 major motion picture films with casts such as Tiffany Haddish, Oscar Isaac, Keanu Reeves, Lily Collins, um, you know, the list goes on. Harry Golding, he has one coming out. uh, um, Elizabeth Banks, Sigourney Weaver, these things don't just happen. They happen because we create the opportunities. We work hard, we collaborate, we we practice gratitude, right? We've talked about all these things. We know the value we bring and that's how we get to the places that we're getting to. And not only that, going to the places that we've still going to right because your girl's not done no no we're just getting started so um and even with this yes it always kind of it's this this kind of bittersweet moment when i come to the end of a season because i love serving the community everything that we create i do it just knowing some people won't like it but a lot of people love it and i'm thankful that we are a globally top rated we are top rated five percent podcast in the world especially on our subject knowing that we're creating social impact through storytelling, through the people that you get to meet, through the validation, through the conversations. That's what we're here to do, right? And, you know, going back to even being at Cannes Film Festival, a lot of the ways that we work hard in the entertainment and media space, that collaboration, you have to get out there. You know, the pandemic severely uh, inhibited the way that we did it. We fought to continue doing it through. That's why I ended up getting vaccinated. I didn't want to be vaccinated, but I wanted to be able to go out there, be able to travel. And I wanted to do it as safely as I could personally. So it was a personal decision for myself. And, you know, when I was at places like South by Southwest and meeting the people that I needed to meet, making new connections, reestablishing old ones, being present, being seen, learning, growing, being a fixture in my industry. That's why we do these things. Right. So, you know, everyone that I bring to you and have these conversations with, they're in alignment with that same ideology. They are not people sitting on the couch hoping for things to happen. They are making them happen and they are doing it well, you know, so and, and it's not easy. It's never easy, but it's worth it. That's something I can promise you. So, you know, like I've said, we, we talked about um, knowing the value that you bring, you know, trusting the process. How do we do it? Uh, knowing that there's only certain things that you can you control and really there's not much that we can control in life and if you worry about the things that you can't control you're only going to diminish your opportunity to get those things done um keeping the positive mindset having faith all these things visualizing your success right like okay when you when you see a trailer of a film you see this vision cast, you're like, you get very excited and then you wanna go see that movie. Well, get excited about your own trailer, create your own mental trailer for whatever it is that you wanna do and then go make it happen. Make it a reality, Uh, make it from a trailer into a full overwhelming life experience. Um, Ignoring the naysayers, right? People are always gonna come and hate on you, but you have to be strong enough and sure enough and be willing to bet on yourself that you don't care what they say you don't care what they think what is it we said before when somebody tells you you can't do something I told you look them in the eye and tell them you just showed me your limitations but you did not show me mine so that's what we you know what I love about what we do and even in embracing failure 
understanding that there is no such thing as failing, just trying. And even if you quote unquote fail, you learn and you take that, you readjust and you just keep moving forward, keep it moving. So these are just things that we've covered and I'm very excited because our guest today is gonna put a just beautiful big bow on it. I know it and, and I love it. So without further ado, let's get him on. George Hori is a multifaceted writer, actor, artist, producer, and songwriter who truly epitomizes the essence of the modern era. He's a leader in the new school of contemporary artists who are using their diverse talents to create art and music across all mediums. Hailing from Los Angeles, he is making music and film that is driven by a desire to motivate, inspire, comfort, and to express himself in an innovative and creative way. As an actor, George has been seen on shows such as The Mindy Project, Investigation Discovery, Shaws of Sunset, and many more. More. He has a role in Machine Gun Kelly's upcoming movie, Good Morning. His parody with Bark Barker, Baker, excuse me, for Drake's Hotline Bling music video has amassed over 25 million streams, and he has proven his talent behind the camera as well as he created, wrote, and produced the pilot for Black Coffee series, which won over 50 f- film festivals internationally. As a musician, he's the embodiment of originality with more projects on the way, including, including a music album as well as a pilot for his next series. George seems to be only at the tip of the iceberg for his career and here to talk about help here to talk and help wrap up another amazing season and discuss trusting the process. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. George Hori. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here and I got to tell all my friends introduce me in the same exact way because I feel like they're cutting me short you know right right you just you just walk around it you I love how multifaceted you are um but you know thank you for being here I really appreciate it share with us a little bit about your background and even your the multicultural aspect of your life that influences your work today for sure like being multifaceted I think too often is looked down upon right now especially in society where I feel people are trying to limit you. Like what my cousin told me, he never compares himself to other people because then you're limiting yourself to their potential. And you never know what your own potential is going to be. So more often than none, people are are afraid to wear multiple hats. And that's just not me. So I look up to people like Mindy Kaling, who acts and directs, Donald Glover, who writes, acts, and sings as well. And these types of talents that are just proof that you could do whatever you want to. You could be successful in multiple fields. And and too often we're told that we can't. And I want to break that thought to everybody listening. More on me and my background. I started as a writer. I would say as early as the age of five. My mother bought me an ad libs book. And I fell in love with words right away. Um, so Mad Libs book, if you haven't seen that, it's where you basically fill in the word with like the adjective, yeah, noun, <laughs> and all that good stuff. And I fell in love with the ability to tell stories with words. And I was like, wow, writing is it. I didn't have the same feelings for math. I have the same feelings for money, just not math. And going into this, I just continued writing. I started writing poems. I wrote songs. I started writing short stories. And I would say that writing is basically my main fuel for all of my projects that I do. I later got into music. I fell deeply in love with music. When I was young, I had a crush on The Little Mermaid. I thought it'd be Princess Jasmine. Most people think that, but it ended up being Little Mermaid. And the music instructor, he came to our class and he played Under the Sea on this mini tuba. It's a baritone. And I liked how it sounded, so I started playing the baritone when I was younger. I just thought that it wasn't so cool carrying this big case on the bus. So I ended up quitting the baritone. My parents were mad about it because I was going to get a scholarship. They wouldn't have to help pay for college. But eventually fell in love with hip hop. Um, a lot of kids in my school would be freestyling and battling in the lunchroom. So I started there, really got into it. And then an art teacher um, showed me how to start recording myself, started making music, did music for a long time in Washington, D.C., where I was raised, performed in lots of nightclubs, and had my calling to Los Angeles. Made it out to L.A., and naturally being in L.A., there's a lot of TV stuff going on. So I got on a reality TV show called Chaws of Sunset. I think it was the first time I was on a national show. Um, And then I just wanted to pursue acting a little more and circling back to my craft of writing. And after being on TV, I said, hey, I could write my own show. And that's exactly what I did. So I wrote a show called Black Coffee. It was actually the first script I ever wrote in my life. And I basically filmed that, went through the festivals and got it sold to uh, Funny or Die. So that's 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 my background as an entertainer. 
That's mm. incredible. So a couple things on that. A, I just, I love the Mad Libs part. And mm -hmm. it, I really resonate as a writer myself. Don't forget, guys, I am a multi-award winning, uh, multiple award winning writer. Damn right so you I, are. Yes. And, and, and it's funny that you said it because math, I, it's not that I wasn't good at math. I just didn't like it. Something about numbers was never as appealing to me. Now, as a businesswoman, I get it. I'm, I know how to operate in the red and all those type of things. But I, I not only loved words so much, even like, one of my jokes in the uh, like or tricks when I would be around people is I would say I can spell try touch a match a carbonethylene but I don't like adding and then they'd look at me and be like you said what <laughs> and I just would have fun with it um and even I remember dating a guy one time who said you know you don't have to talk like that we know you're smart and I was laughing because I'm like what do you mean there's just lots of words in the language why are we not using them have you ever had anybody give you that like because I find that if you love words you tend to have a more extensive vocab yeah have you ever had people give you shit for, for your vocab? sure <laughs> I, had, I had a friend who told me you know just because you use big words doesn't mean you're smart I'm like, leave, leave me alone I'm not trying to make a statement I like words and um, I've, I've heard that a lot, too. So <laughs> it's like there's I lots of them, guys. There's lots of mm -hmm. them. You should try it sometimes, <laughs> yeah. right? But um, so, OK, tell me, what would somebody be surprised to know about you? Surprised to know about me. I actually I'm a big fan of Sam Smith. I get made fun of for that sometimes, too. But I think Sam Smith is a really excellent singer. I love his range and stuff. Mm -hmm. And listening to that style of music, a lot of people know that I do hip hop. Mm -hmm. But in my free time, I like to listen to a lot of down tempo music mm, down and tempo soft music and, and hear people sing. I guess naturally, a lot of hip hop artists, they always want to be singers because it's like the challenge to do. And I'm, I, I've am i experimented with, with that myself lately. But I do like to listen to some slower music in my free time. A lot of people wouldn't know that about me. Mm. Going back to something you also said, Shaws of Sunset. So mm -hmm. funny enough, yes, the fir the world was first introduced to, y to you. Yeah. And I say this, it, I, a common denominator, by the way, Mike Showhead was my business partner oh, wow. at that same time. Um, and, uh, That's funny. And, we, you know, we were very close for a minute mm -hmm. working together. In fact, I was at his wedding. I was at his engagement. I was at his wedding and I actually had coffee with him the day he was served divorce papers. By Jessica. Oh, wow. <laughs> so do you, get yeah. a, do you get a chance to meet his father? And his oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Oh yeah, really nice people. Oh, amazing people, amazing people, and and Jess, Jess and I are are, are good friends, and so, anyways, um, so the world saw you, and they called you the Persian Drake. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, what that, was that like? Because for the listening my, audience, you know, <laughs> you go on a show, and then you're hoping that when your name pops up on the screen, it's gonna say your name, because you want to get all those Twitter followers right. and all the Instagram your lower followers. corners. <laughs> But uh, unfortunately for me, they didn't put my name on the screen. They came up with this name, Persian Drake, which kind of sucked because at the time, I don't know if you remember my episode, I was a number one uh, trending topic on Twitter somewhere up there. Yes. And so people were searching for me and couldn't find me. Right. So and that, that was Because you're neither Persian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, one time I was watching uh, Tony Rock do his stand up over at the Laugh Factory and um, he, 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 he was in the middle of his set. And then in the middle of his set, he's like, wait a second. Doesn't this dude over here look like Drake? And someone in the audience had recognized me from right, uh, a sure. Bravo show, and they go, that's not Drake, that's a Persian Drake. <laughs> so I yelled at him, and I'm not even Persian. And he stares at me, he's like, and you're not even Drake. And everyone started laughing. Now, that guy's really funny. That Quick is witty. hilarious. So that was, that was like a little awkward, but I think people just like over time saw some sense of endearment as like the Persian people liking me. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's cool. You well, it was still it a way to, to represent Middle Eastern culture in general, <laughs> no, right? right? Somewhat, yeah. right? Um, but did that, was that also, I mean, you? But, but to not take away from what you do, I mean, yes, that was part of your experiences in life, you know, but you do all these other amazing things, the music. What's like your driving force? I would say that the driving force um, in terms of the talent would always be the writing but in terms of the passion is just knowing how that we only get one shot at this. Right. And that's been taken away from me nearly before, you know, I've been in a, in a life or death situation. And in that moment, you could see that your life could be cut short and you ask yourselves a question, why am I here? Uh, what legacy am I going to leave behind when I go? What is the purpose? What is the daily purpose of me being here? Who are the lives I'm going to impact? How will I be remembered? And that's something that became super important to me at the age of 11, uh, flying out of a car window 15 feet into the middle of the street, wow. having my head split open, being in a coma, almost getting uh, run over by other cars. It's a lot for an 11-year-old to take Ooh, on. I didn't even 
didn't even and, know that. Yeah, and through my recovery, um, just basically was just so thankful and grateful to just wake up every morning. And every 24 hours I see is another opportunity to create something new. Yeah. I love creation. So creating became my way of showing gratitude to life. Because creation, and speaking about the theme of infinity, is one of the things that isn't fine. That you could create as much as you want in many different areas as you want. And that's why I took it, uh, took the lanes into all these different arts. I just have a natural high off creating and putting projects out and just maximizing my time on earth. And with every project I do, I feel like I'm leaving something behind mm. for the next artist to appreciate or the next person to appreciate. Yeah. And, and in fact, to my surprise, um, I started doing these things called the words of the week where I would just do, you know, whatever I was feeling that day, I would put up on my Instagram, just a nice thought or quote. So I put up a quote about just persevere, persevering and making it through. And I got a DM from this woman. She said that basically she had recently been in a car accident. Her legs were severed in the accident. And she was supposed to go to rehab to try and walk again. But she felt so defeated. And she was in a sad place. She couldn't even play with her three-year-old. And said that basically because she read my words, she was inspired to go out to rehab and try and walk again. And uh, a year later, I got this message saying, George, thanks to you, I could, I'm playing with my three-year-old, my four-year-old now. <laughs> and that just was insane to me that my words or something I created could leave that impact that I'm talking about. Yeah. So that right there is my driving force. And sometimes you're doing things just to have fun. But you never know who it's going to impact and where it's going to end up. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. That, it, I, I, that resonates with me. And I think yeah. that as a creator, when you really recognize your impact and that's what's driving you, it's a beautiful thing. Because it's, we say, I, I'm doing this, but you're also recognizing, I'm sure, that you're also like, you're a conduit. Like, I feel as a writer, whenever or when we're doing these things, I'm a conduit. And I know that, like, for you, uh, in a world that is constantly seeking definition and clarity – you know, you, you, your one enigma dares to blur the lines and reshape the way we think about entertainers. You know, that's how you see yourself. So it tell, expand on that for me. How do you see that happening? Well, a lot of the times, you know, if we like it or not, and I think being famous has this negative connotation to it. Oh, you want to be a celebrity. You want to be Hollywood. When I move out of the East Coast, everyone's like, oh, you're Hollywood now. Um, so there's this connotation that's carried by being an entertainer that it, that implies that you're just basically a superficial person or you just are all self-absorbed. And, you know, that may be the case for some people and we may have our days. But really, the lane that I'm seeing here is you do need to have some sort of sphere of influence or platform. And we see small glimpses of this. We see someone put up a clip for 15 seconds and it goes viral on the internet. Now is being famous such a bad thing or if that viral clip, clip touched people, does, not, does that now become a good thing? And that's the lane that I see for myself that the bigger the platform I can have, the more people I could impact or at least the more people I could be in front of to make a positive change. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness, that's so... So when you speak, it's very clear you have, you know, and I think it's amazing because you're showing this. I love it when we break stereotypes and mm -hmm. when we break molds. So, you know, you have this business side of you as well as an entertainer. How do they work with each other to accomplish this overall goal that you have? Yeah, you, both are super important. And you find that either either the artist has the business savvy or they have a manager. <laughs> so if you're an artist right now, you don't have that, I'd suggest developing it or get a manager who really knows what they're doing. You know, I remember being on set for the Mindy Project, and that was my first acting gig after my reality gig, right, in Hollywood. And it was Mindy Kaling. Um, she was acting in, in my scene. And she stopped and started directing the scene, too. And I, I found that to be so fascinating that... She, here she is. She's an artist, uh, the star of the show, but she's also having the ability to direct the entire scene. And I was like, wow, that was super inspiring. You can do both. And we see uh, figures like Jay-Z who have done both. It's super critical. Um, don't be afraid to explore. Don't Again, it goes back to don't be pigeonholed. Don't feel like you could only do one thing. If you're curious about something, research it. Learn the business side because without that, 
you're not going to be able to keep your brand alive as an artist and you're not going to be able to roll out your projects properly. Yeah. What is most important to you for people to know about the brand that you've been building and continue to build? My brand is all about, I think it's very in line with your brand, actually, Alia, is just being infinite in possibility of what you can do. Don't allow anyone or self-doubt to ever limit you. I want people to go above and beyond. I expect that of myself. Every morning when I wake up, I expect that of my friends. Sometimes I could be overbearing for people, but again, I'm super sensitive to because of my experiences of how sensitive life is and how fast it could be taken away. So if you're going to be here, make it count. If you have a dream, don't sit back on it and don't be that person looking back and having regrets because that's one of the worst positions you could ever be in. You know, my only regret when I look back is not working even more. (laughs) So when I look back, I'm never thinking, oh, I should have tried this. I should have tried that because I did try it. And guess what? A lot of the times when it did feel the Uh, first few times there's proof in the pudding that it succeeded and it's out there and no one can take that away from me and I want as many people possible that to share that same feeling Mm -hmm. not a selfish person I actually get happy when I see other people around me succeed and there is room for everyone to win and that's like my number one thing or campaign behind everything I do (laughs) yeah and you know it's interesting because something that you just said not to be funny but I I, I always use Drake as an example (laughs) when I talk about collaboration because you know when I worked in the music industry a couple decades ago um when you saw collaboration that's when you saw the most growth you saw you know the ability to expand to different audiences and and things like that and then you and in an industry where sometimes people are so focused on their goals, right? I need to get ahead. I need the hit single. They forget collaboration is key. And, you know, how has collaboration played a part in what you're doing? Because I know actually I'm going to give a shout out to fame. You know, you just, you know, you, hey, you look for people to work with. And like you said, you're not selfish. So you want to share in this experience. But yeah, what is it that you look for in collaborations and how do they impact your projects? So first of all, rewinding it back to Drake, to even remotely resemble someone and they happen to be Drake, those are big shoes to fill. And that's a a bar set very high. So imagine if you resemble Drake and you're just like a failure in life. So that's not an option for me. If if I'm constantly being compared to perhaps the greatest artist of all time, you know, you you can't lack. You can't, can't lack in anything. And then going back to collaborations, and we even saw in the scenario of Drake having the Little Wayne uh, collaborations being so critical to the start of his career, I think that is super necessary. When you do collab with someone, first of all, you're tapping into their audience. On the business side, you're tapping into a whole new audience and not just yours. A lot of the times, even myself as an artist, I stop and ask myself, am I doing this project for vanity purposes to say I did it or to have proof that I did it? Or am I actually trying to stick to my game plan and get in front of people and influence them? And when I have those reality checks, nine times out of 10, I'm thinking about who can I collaborate with to expand more? So in my personal career, having Busta Rhymes on my tribute record to hip hop, which was Ghost, got me really great visibility and and a lot of respect. And I somehow tapped into some of his audience, which was super helpful. And I think just expedited my career on the music side of things in terms of the film collabing. Um, Actually, what people may not know, another thing people may not know about me or or my projects is that my Black Coffee uh, show, I actually filmed the pilot three times. Oh, wow. Three entire times. So the first time, it was so horrible (laughs) that it was just like automatic, I got to do this again. The second time, I I collaborated. I pulled in people who were more talented on the camera than I was or more talented directing than I was or more experienced producing than I was. Although I still had all those credits in there, I'd still, I had help. And the third time I had filmed it, that's where it just really took off right? and did what it did. And, you know, some great collaborations on there um, really made the difference for me. Well, I love it because I, you know, there's the saying practice makes perfect, right? And I'm like, Dis- I love, mm-hmm. dispel that, stop. Practice makes better. And to your point, even about like just um, the way when we talk about failing, right? Like you said, it wasn't good, but what did, how did you grow in that process? So there's, again, I mean, we talk about failure, everyone's like, oh, you know, but you didn't give up. 
and you grew and then you took what you learned from each situation and then used that to fuel you further right like how, is that how you see failure as more of sometimes a launching pad as opposed to like oh of course yeah if, if you're not failing then you're you're probably not winning either because nobody wins every time yes and it's impossible to win if you don't take the step and if you take the step you are going to fail most of the time but guess what some of the time you're going to win Mm -hmm. And in order to get to the wins, you have to be willing to fail. And and my gosh, we're, we're in Hollywood. You know, you go to these auditions. You have people tell you no to your face. You could tell, even if they don't say it to your face, you know when someone's like, okay, this isn't going to work out. Or you get rejected. And a lot of my, I remember when I was acting, this was even before COVID where you could do these self-tape, you know, submissions and virtual. You would, you would not be able to have a full-time job because you need to be available for an audition. So you're already now not making money. Then you have these part-time gigs, but the days that you have auditions, you're not doing the part-time gig. You're spending money getting a haircut, looking good, or getting your hair done, getting makeup on, driving, putting gas in your car, paying for parking, You know, sometimes even buying a new outfit if it's needed. So now you're losing money just to drive somewhere and spend the whole day hearing a no. Right. Now, I do have friends who are un incapable of hearing the no, and guess what? They went back to the East Coast. I knew when I came out here that there was nothing that was going to make me go home. Mm. I, I was going to keep going until I made it. And resilience um, is the ingredient that needs to be paired with failure. Mm -hmm. So people are like, don't be afraid of failure, but they don't give you the extra in ingredient you need. The most important ingredient you need to face failure in order to ultimately win is this nice ingredient called resilience. And you need to bring that with you. Bring that to work with you if you want to win. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because I feel in, it's a characteristic that causes you to always see the silver lining, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're still, uh, the resilience is a silver lining person. Like I remember I have an incident where my, um, I t I've told it before, but like my adopted sister and I, this is again decades ago, we ran out of gas and we're pushing the car. We're both in heels. I picked her up off work. We're like, you know, pushing the car. And, and I look at her and I say, well, it could be worse. And she looks at me, she's like, Alia, how could this be worse? And I said, it could be raining, okay? And she there looks and she says, you know, touche, you're so right. So, you know, when you have a moment and what, what, what do you feel is your silver lining? I mean, you shared this amazing experience mm -hmm. and, and, but like in your adult life now, you carry that forward. Yeah. Is, do you have those silver lining moments? Yeah, for sure. Um, just looking back to when my pilot was rejected from every single film festival, I got accepted by zero festivals, but here I am sitting in my room at the time. I said, I know, I know that the script is good. I'm a writer, so I'm not lying to myself. I'm reading through it. I'm like, this is good. And I'm watching episodes on TV and I'm saying, Hey, um, this could be my show. Right. So you have to ask your, yourself the question, the silver lining. And it's exactly what you said. And, and I'm going to double down on what you said is that maybe you can't be perfect, but you could be better. Mm -hmm. so the silver lining is to always ask yourself, how can I be better? Well, mm -hmm. in, in the case of my first pilot, the visual quality, the way it was shot, didn't match the writing. So what do I need to do to make that better? So now I basically start reaching out to different camera operators, editors, producers, and I get a new team together. Said, let's do this. And um, this is where resilient kicks, resilience kicks into play because now I had the team. And the night before we were shooting, basically the venue we had that said we could shoot there, which was the most important, uh, most important part of the pilot right. and expensive part, they pulled out. So now, now it's the day before filming the second time. The actor's schedules were difficult to get everyone together. And we basically have no coffee shop because black coffee takes place in a coffee shop. No coffee shop to film in. And I remember I was, I was on uh, Ventura Boulevard in Studio City driving back to Hollywood. And the, my producer is in the car with me. And I, and I say to him, you know, this just has to work. We just have to stop somewhere. He said, well, the coffee shop's here are going to be even more expensive. I was like, what about that one? And I point to this coffee shop we're driving by. So that's even bigger than the one we wanted to shoot in. And it looks brand new. You know how expensive that's going to be? I said, we just have to try it. I pull over and I see this older gentleman and um, he's inside. And I go and I just bang on the glass. And there was no one in there for some reason. And the guy comes out and he's like, you know, can I help you? Um, we're, we're closed right now. I was like, well, I actually don't want to come in for coffee. I was wondering if I could use your place to film. 
And then he just pauses and he's staring at me. And I'm like, this is super awkward. And then, I, and then you know, when you're nervous, I blurt out the next thing. I was like, and I don't have a budget. <laughs> and the guy stares at me even harder. <laughs> and then he says to me, you know what? Um, this is a sign. I said, uh, I don't get it. What, what sign? He said, well, the original owner of this place was my best friend. And he committed suicide last week. And I promised myself that I'd see this coffee shop through for him. And he was an artist and his whole vision was to create a coffee shop that was open to artists, that was affordable to artists, that allowed artists to express themselves and network and come here. And he's like, you stopped at the right place. And the man handed me the key to the shop and said, it's yours the whole weekend. I didn't even sign a liability paper. I didn't pay him a dollar. Got wow. it done. But if I didn't have resilience, if I didn't have first the recognition that I needed to do better, um, just basically studying your work, don't get recency bias, don't get self affirmation, show your work and don't always take criticism um, as something that's trying to destroy you. And, and I know a lot of time people are trying to do that. But sometimes if you have a trusted person in your field and they're giving you feedback, be open to hearing the feedback. See, that that was a step that I was open to hearing. I recognized, oh, it could be better. I didn't lie to myself and said, this looks so good. And then I had the resilience literally down to the evening before I was supposed to shoot. And I was about to call the entire cast and cancel to actually try the impossible. Right. And I made the impossible possible by just simply pulling over and asking a question. Yeah. And a lot of the time, people forget about resilience. And they're just quickly defeated the silver lining is there always is a chance to make some sort of progress. It may not be what you hoped for, but you need to search for those doors and you need to be bold enough to run through them. Oh, I love that. And yeah, I mean, when we talked about, you know, everything. So I told you who's going to help put a bow on it, you guys. <laughs> but, you know, th that's having faith in the unknown. I mean, how do we trust the process and why so that you can accomplish the things that you're trying to accomplish, whether it's a small goal or the big, hairy, audacious goal? What is your big, hairy, audacious goal? Like, wh right. where do we see you in five, ten years? Yeah. So um, so in terms of trusting the process, what I wanted to add to a lot of people have difficulty trusting the process because they don't love the process. Mm, good point. They simply love the results they're seeing and they're not in love with the behind the scenes work that goes behind it. So they want the same results that XYZ celebrity has, but they don't want to put in the work to get there. They want to walk the red carpet, but they don't want to be in the studio late hours. They don't want to be, you know, um, in the rehearsal room late hours. So you have to really love the process in order to trust it. I've learned to love the process. I'm ready to grind. I'm ready to, you know, put in the 10,000 hours that they say it takes. And my ultimate goal, I would see, I, I look up to people like Tyler Perry for my ultimate goal. So I want my name to resonate not only as an actor, but also as a producer and open up st studios that help give people a voice and a platform and try and make thousands of more writer, actor, producer, artists. And that's where I see myself in five years. I've, I've gotten the first steps done, and now I want it to expand, and I'm hyper-focused and ready to take that on. That's amazing. I love that. And I love that you're Tyler Perry focused. It's it's a it's a good role because, you know, it's not just fame, but it's the power and influence to actually do things for others mm -hmm. as well as yourself So and your community. Um, I, we had shared a picture while you were talking for our, our viewing audience, and but I want to kind of go back to it because you mentioned ghosts and the collaboration with Buster Rhymes. You were in New York. Your 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 picture, everything, the um, promotional uh, collateral of it is in in Times Square, not like off Times, like in Times mm -hmm. Square, and you're standing there. I remember pic people were taking pictures with you. I mean, what was that moment like? How did that feel? That moment was bittersweet because in, in one aspect, I was thinking in my head, man, there's so many people who should have been here with me, mm. but they're not because they didn't see my vision mm. because they didn't have the resilience that I had to stay around. So in some aspect, there are certain people I wanted there who weren't. But then on the flip end of the coin, having strangers walk up to me who have heard my work and appreciate me was all I could have ever asked for as an artist. So it was euphoric. 
And I want many more of those moments. I have another pilot I'm working on. I have another album I'm dropping. And you know what? I'm going to drop my album at Alia's birthday party this summer. That's what I'm going to do. That's right. So the Party Hills album is coming out. And it, the release date is going to be her birthday party. <laughs> so if you're not invited, I'm sorry. I think I'm barely, I think I just invited myself to it. No. But that's where I'm dropping it. So I have that coming up. And I hope to make a huge impact with that album. In fact, one of the singles on it has already uh, streamed on Virgin Radio in, um, in Lebanon. Yeah. And I, I've heard from some people, they debuted there, and I got some messages of people saying they're here again on their way to work. So hopefully we'll get it in the U.S. and other countries. And um, I'm just super excited about yeah. the future. What, okay, so, in, and I love how, because you said, I know I've had the pleasure of listening, and, like, I love it. And even, like, Daft Funk, you know, you, you, you go in between, uh, you like you said, you have this dance style, you've got the hip-hop and R&B influence, but really, what do you categorize your style as, or, or what's the audience you are attracting with your, with your music? So, I try and attract a broad audience as possible, and for that reason, I don't use profanity in my records, because I figure... I want kids to be able, my nephews, I want them to be able to jam out to it as well as the grown folks too. And my music, I've been through so much pain in my life that there are moments in my music which you could hear that in the real moments. But overall, why I'm um, naming my album Party Hills, I want people to have feel good vibes when they listen. If I achieve that, whether it's in hip hop or whether it's in EDM, which I'm exploring as well, I want someone to hear my music and just feel good. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what does that. But the upbeatness of it, you know, the cool dancing major notes, the synthesizers and all that fun stuff. As long as someone could hear my music and have a fun time, it may be even a witty lyric that I add in that makes someone laugh. But that that's really what I want the most, mm -hmm. because I've been through enough pain um, and I want to I don't want people to experience that or keep people in painful moments. I want sure. people to be able to be uplifted. And if my music can do that, the same way I hope that my parodies have or my shows have, my comedy shows, I want my music to do the same. I love that. Because also I feel like as a trauma survivor, I think that having a sense of humor um, and even music itself, it's such a part of my healing. It's a part sure. of like my thriving life. If I don't have music, if I don't have those vibrations, right? If we, I love it. Nikola Tesla says, if you think of, if you want to unlock the secrets of the world, think in terms of frequencies, vibrations, and um, energy. And so to me, music creates that and has that, right? Um, there's even sound healing. Uh, and same with comedy, like comedy. I mean, I will, I will be cracking the craziest jokes on my deathbed, and they'll probably be about death. Like I know, and I've been, I've like, it's mm -hmm. just how, and I think it's the way that we, that resilience, na that resilient nature, right? What is your creative process for creating this music? Oh, I like that. So it's my creative process is the same with my music as it is with my writing. So and my screenplays. So Black Coffee came from a real place. It was a story I experienced working in the nightclubs in Washington, D.C. for about five years. And my music is also based on real life experiences. A lot of the time, my music is romantic. So dating experiences, and I try and keep the good ones in the music. Uh, my process is just something that I've gone through that has moved me or inspired me to do more or made me feel good, that's what ends up being in my story. And whether it be through writing or through audio, uh, I would say that that's my creative process to sit on, reflect on moments in my life that have uplifted me or moved me and turn them into art. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. I can appreciate that. And that's why if you're in the audience, you definitely want to check out my boy. Um, what like what's okay so you have the album coming up what else like you you know what are what are the other things that you have in the pipeline coming out so in the pipeline over uh the quarantine i wrote a script for my first feature film it's called the girl without the gloves um, it was a story that was presented to me by alan Mackey of epic films he's also like you has won some pretty big festivals so shout out to alan he brought this story to me and I added my twist on it. I don't want to give too much away. Right. <laughs> um, it was challenging for me because it wasn't a comedy. 
So I'm finding ways, even in this drama that I wrote, to sprinkle in the comedy. Right. That always got to be, I got to make someone smile at some point. That's just always going to be there. I was, I'm, I'm the middle child. I'm the class clown that's always been in me. I don't like the word clown. I'm the class <laughs> king with humor. And um, so that's always been in me to, to try and sprinkle in the comedy. So that feature film, draft one, is pretty much together. And it should have a box office release coming up um, internationally, hopefully in the next year or so. I'm also working on a pilot for my next comedy. So I figured if, I, if I've done it once, I could do it again. 100%. And um, that was my dad's advice, actually, to just basically replicate my success there. So I am going to do another pilot, which is another comedy series based on a real life experience. And that's going to be all comedy. Super excited about that. That is exciting. I know. I mean, you know, you, you know, my husband does a lot as well. And and I can understand the anticipation. But it, so you should be so proud of yourself for all that you've done and all that you're accomplishing. And I love that you had brought up the people that should be there, but they didn't have that same, you know, and I've had that same thing mm -hmm. where people not, and it's like I just I arrive at moments when I'm like, you messed up. You know, I really wanted you to be here. You could have been here. But, you know, I think also part of the process and trusting the process is not worrying so much about what falls out of the back of the truck is keeping it moving forward. And, you know, even as and I'm going to, uh, you know, ask this about being an artist. A lot of times people struggle with pursuing their dream and then still holding a job and creating an opportunity. Right. Like you don't become an artist without you invest in yourself. You invest in your dream. What's the best advice you can give to an, an artist out there who's still trying to manage, you know, they want to pursue this acting, they want to pursue this, but they also have to have a job and they have to find ways to still fuel their dream. You know, what is your best advice on how you've navigated that? So I saw this in real time um, when I was an actor, I was getting my headshots done. I have a buddy named Sky and Olya, who's his wife. Uh, Sky at one point was a model and and he's very successful at it and Olya was a photographer well he learned how to take photos through his wife and he became a really good photographer and I still use him till this day and what he did there was brilliant to me because he was making money now in something that wasn't too far from his craft and I'll mm -hmm. tell you how while he was shooting me with his wife this is a world-class model not that I am, but he's giving me the sauce on how to pose. See, he he had that insight and that knowledge to share and, and add to this craft. So my advice to artists, and I've learned through this as well with my writing, is basically finding ways to make money in entertainment, in your passions. And it's not going to always be your direct goal of whatever that is, but there are things around your goal that you're talented in. Find jobs in those areas, just like Sky. Shout out to uh, Sky Unicorn Productions. Um, and that's just a perfect example of someone who's, who went from being a model, and I believe he still models, to a photographer. And he has the knowledge to do both. And keep it close to your field. Monetize as close to your passions as possible. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It's, but, you know, if you're too far away from what you're trying to do, then how are you going to get in there? And even when people talk about getting into film and, and acting or production and directing, you know, we always have to tell them, like, get a PA job. Like, the first, you know, get your foot in the door, learn and expand your skill exactly. set. Exactly, because you're not going to feel so removed at that point. You're not right. going to feel so isolated. One of the most lonely feelings is, you know, a lot of people think it's like maybe in a relationship you know, breaking up with someone and missing your partner. To me, the most lonely thing I've ever experienced is being isolated from my dreams. Mm. And whatever I do when I wake up in the morning, what am I going to do today that's going to keep me close to my dreams, even if it's therapeutic, even if it's chilling on the beach in Santa Monica and, and meditating. I'm in Santa Monica. I'm, I'm still right next to L.A. where a lot of things can go down. So just stay as close to your dreams and passions as possible. How does gratitude how do you, how does gratitude show up for you personally in your life at this point? For me, I I'm I pay it forward. So I have a lot of friends who maybe I see myself when I started my career and there were a few people in my life who did stick around and those are the same people who helped me with money when I needed or helped me with love when I needed or helped me with a resource when I need it. And I try to be that same person for my friends in that position. And it, it's so interesting. Every time I give 
I receive in abundance every single time. I'm not afraid to share or afraid to give because putting that loving energy out there, and even if you don't believe in all the spiritual stuff, um, think about it. If you're helping someone in your field and now they become successful, what do you think they're going to do when they make it? Right. You have an ally now to help bring you back on. Yeah. And I've had those instances. I've had those instances where I've helped people and they've called me and said, hey, I saw this this role you should you should audition for it or hey I, hey i know this casting director i want to introduce you and this is someone i helped in the past and and literally most of my bookings as an actor as an artist have actually been through that mm -hmm. i swear to you not through an agency right right a hundred percent and it's funny when you speak on that it makes me think i, I my my husband uh and his and his partner an amazing another entertainment attorney uh iman i gotta give my shout outs to you uh, they um, they actually represent Harry O, right? Um, the co-founder of Death Row Records. And for people who don't know, he's actually well. People say people say he's responsible for Denzel Washington because he had actually funded his first production. But when when I when I had the opportunity to hear him speak on it firsthand, he's he was never he doesn't take it like that. And it was interesting to hear him just discuss on how it was just a form of paying it forward. And then you see you hear you see that and you see how this person contributed to help this young actor out. And then you hear about how Denzel Washington then helped Chadwick Boseman. And so the reason why I'm saying that is because I know that somebody helped, you know, people out there who know that he, he was helped. So, yeah, it's how it, you move it forward. You pay it forward. And it's an amazing opportunity for Harry O when he sits now and has a, you know, a drink or whatever with Denzel. And it's like, wow, look how far that we've come and everything that's happened since then. It's, it's wild. And just a little bit of help can help somebody else. And I feel that, like you just said, when they grow, when they're successful, you still have a moment of, of pride or whatever. Or you're just being used by un the universe to be part of that experience. Absolutely. You, you still get a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were a part in that person's journey. Yeah, absolutely. Whether small or large. Right, right. Well, okay, so um, you have, you're clearly doing amazing things. I'm very excited that we had finally got you in here. I do have some rapid fire questions Let's go. for you. This All right. Fun. I kept them pretty soft for you, so okay. you know. <laughs> this first question, though, might make it. Okay, if a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be and who would play you? Wow. <laughs> I would say um, <laughs> it would be uh, a drama, like I'm thinking about Pursuit of Happiness. And I don't think that Will Smith could play me the same <laughs> way Sasha Baron Cohen could. So he, oh. he would play. And I've seen him do drama and he's nice with it. I know. I love it. For our listening audience, you're going to have to check out the video because, <laughs> yeah, I see how people do Sasha Baron Cohen with you and then Drake. Like, yeah. these are the two I get, comparisons. I could do both. Right? I love it. Okay. If you got a yacht what would you call it i would call it the party since i got the party hills it would be the party water yacht <laughs> for party sure <laughs> easy i love it um what is the best advantage to being really tall the best advantage to being really tall is when you're grocery shopping hitting that top shelf it's amazing <laughs> that because every time i'm like i need some help i have to call my son it's so funny um they always know when something's not me <laughs> in the house if it's tall they're like we know you didn't put it there okay what fortune would you want to get from a fortune cookie that i will be the next tyler perry oh i love that okay and last but not least if you could teleport where would you go and why if i could teleport i would go to south france only because my brother has toured the world and he's hasn't stopped talking about South France, so I want to see it for myself. Oh, that's so cute! Because I'll be there next week, and I can totally of validate. Of course it's you amazing. will. Amazing. And of course I wasn't invited. <laughs> Again. Hey, everybody's always invited to Canada. Come, <laughs> come, come, see us. We'll be there. No, I'm super proud of you. That, that's amazing. Next year, next year we'll be there. We'll I'll have we'll have the yacht, Party Hills yacht, and we'll do it correct, right? Yep, we'll, we'll be both, celebrating. We'll both be winning out there. Of course, always, always. So for our listening audience, where can they support you, check you out, check out your work? Where do you want them to go? Sure, just follow me on the gram at George Corey Official, last name K-H-O-U-R-I. Amazing. Thank you so much for being Thank here you. today. It was a I pleasure. love you and appreciate you. I love you too. I'm <laughs> super proud of you. I'm excited to see what we both achieve in the next year. Yeah, yeah. It'll be exciting. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. We'll see you appreciate again. It. Bye bye.
to everyone else at home, oh my goodness, that's that. This is it. But guess what? We're not done. We only continue to grow, do more amazing things, keep it going. Um, I hope that you've had as much fun this season as I have. I hope that you will continue trusting the process, grow expand do all the things that you dream of doing right um, in the meantime though don't forget to support unsugarcoated media www.unsugarcoatedmedia.com forward slash shop you can check out our merchandise you can check us out on youtube where you can catch our shorts that we've produced and promote to just have a good message out there and let's see you can follow me on social media you can check out where i'll be speaking around the world when i'm not podcasting but thank you so much thank you for supporting us thank you for being with us and we do look forward to seeing you next time and most importantly thank you so much for letting us be unsugarcoated take care bye <laughs>